this morning, Pastor Paul. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. I don't think it's fair that I have to follow that. It's just, but life isn't fair, right? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, please open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 4. Please open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 4. Who's going down, Maria? Junior high can be dismissed. While you're turning there, just as a matter of introduction, in April 1866, Friendship Cemetery in Columbus, Mississippi, there was a group of women who decorated the graves of fallen soldiers with flowers to commemorate the lives of those who died in the bloody Civil War that had ended about a year earlier. After decorating the graves of her two sons who served during the Civil War as Confederate soldiers, one of the women also decorated two mounds at the corner of the cemetery. An observer asked, what are you doing? Those are the graves of two Union soldiers. The woman replied, I know. I also know that somewhere in the North, a mother or a young wife mourns for them as we do for ours. That small band of ladies set in motion what we know as the Memorial Day commemoration. Memorial Day is set aside each year to remember those who gave their lives in the armed forces. We remember those who died in battle while safeguarding our freedoms and democracy. We memorialize their actions by honoring them in ceremonies and parades across the land. Sometimes it's called Decoration Day because we often decorate the graves of fallen heroes with flags and flowers. We continue to commemorate their sacrifice because we may be prone to forget. When Israel crossed the Jordan River to enter the Promised Land for the first time, God commanded Joshua to pile up a mound of stones in that place. Those stones were to become a memorial to the children of Israel forever. They were memorial stones of God's grace. In Joshua chapter 4, it tells of this account, and we're going to read the first nine verses, and then we're going to dig in a little bit. It says, And it came to pass, when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them, saying, Take for yourselves Twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood firm. You shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder." according to the number of tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so, just as Joshua had commanded, and took up 12 stones from the midst of the Jordan, as the Lord had spoken to Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, and carried them over with them to the place where they lodged, and laid them down there. Then Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there to this day. Those memorial stones were probably big boulders. I mean, it says it picked, they picked them up from the midst of the Jordan and laid them on their shoulders. It wouldn't be a pebble or a little stone if they had to lay it on their shoulders. So Joshua was commanded to do this. Why? Because we're prone to forget. The children of Israel were prone to forget. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about 
all of the things they forgot as they were wandering in the wilderness to, to get to the place where God had promised them. We easily forget. You know, the Bible tries to warn us um, against forgetfulness for, of God's grace. In Deuteronomy 6, 12 through 15, it says, Then beware, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and shall take oaths in his name. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you, for the Lord your God is a jealous God among you. Lest the angel of the Lord, anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. Deuteronomy 6, 12 refers to one of the most significant events in the lives of the, of the Israelites, the crossing of the Red Sea. Now we probably all know of that account in the scriptures recorded in the Old Testament. That event is when they were delivered from the hand of a foreign, uh, the Egyptian army, out of bondage and into the freedom of a true relationship with God. But that wasn't the end of the story. In many ways, for them, it was just the beginning. It's interesting to note that the journey from the spot of the Red Sea crossing to the land of Canaan, the land that God had promised them, was only about an 11-day journey. Yet it took them 40 years to finally get there. How often do we take the hard, the hard road, the hard way, to get to where God wants us to go? It's so often because of our stubbornness or our, our pride that we decide to do things our way, as the song goes. Sometimes it takes a while before we realize that God's way is always better. The Red Sea crossing is symbolic of our salvation. By Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, we are free from the bondage of sin. We're brought into a restored relationship with our Heavenly Father. But for those who have been saved, how easily can we forget that God has delivered us from that? And just as the people wandered in the desert for 40 years, don't we sometimes feel like we're just wandering in the wilderness here in this, in this world? That can happen when we forget God's faithfulness, what he's done in our lives. Just as the crossing of the Red Sea speaks of an essential New Testament truth, so too the crossing of the Jordan speaks of vital New Testament truth. The crossing of the Red Sea they were coming out of, right? They were coming out of Egypt. They were coming out of bondage. They were being freed from something bad, where in the crossing of the Jordan, they were in essentially coming into something good. Even though there was challenges when they crossed over into the land. You know, Jesus tells us that we will have tribulation in this world. In John 10.10, 10, he says, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it abundantly, more abundantly. That's the promised land promise for us. An abundant life here. God, through Joshua, led the people through the wilderness into the promised land, but soon... Very soon after that, the people forgot about the promises. They focused more on the land. I like to kind of split that term up a little bit. The promised land has two parts. The promises of God are always true, are steadfast. He can be trusted to accomplish everything in and through us that he has promised, where when we get caught up in the things of this world, sidelined by the worries. Sometimes we forget, don't we? All the promises that God has for us. Verses 1 through 5, it says, And it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan that the Lord said to Joshua, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them, saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones from here, 
out of the midst of the Jordan from the place where the priest's feet stood firm. You shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. The Lord gave instructions here to Joshua to do something tangible for a reason. The reason is that sometimes it takes something tangible for us to remember God's blessings in our lives. There is a need for memorials, I think, today. As we walk in this world, as we see all of the stuff that's coming at us from the culture, and we see the sinfulness of man just played out day to day, isn't there a need for us to have these memorial stones in our lives? And in order to get a better picture of the miracle of the Jordan River crossing, you know, we always think of the Red Sea crossing, and of course we think of the great movie and see the big walls of water, right? But the Jordan crossing was uh, significant as well. It was a miracle, no question about it. So we go back one chapter in Joshua and just take a look for context to understand what this meant to the nation of Israel. In chapter 3 of Joshua, Verses 14 through 17, it says, So it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And those who bore the Ark came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests who bore the Ark dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of harvest, that the waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zaratan. So the waters that went down into the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, failed and were cut off. And the people crossed opposite Jericho. Then the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. You can, you can see here it was at the time of the year in the spring when the snow melt from Mount Hermon and other mountains considerably raised the level of the Jordan River. Normally, the Jordan isn't that impressive. During most of the year, it's only about 100 feet wide and about 5 to 10 feet deep. But at this time, in the spring harvest time, the water stretched perhaps for a mile across and some, in some places 40 feet deep. That's not easily crossed. Notice how the priests stepped out in faith first, right? They stepped out in faith with the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was that representation of God's presence. Nothing miraculous can ever happen unless God is present. His hand upon the nation was undeniable. And that's why Joshua was commanded to set up a memorial as a perpetual sign to the people of God's faithfulness. You know, 40 years earlier, we see that God had performed that miracle of the Red Sea crossing. But very quickly after that, the people got bitter and stubborn. I would, uh, I would just tell you to go back and read through the book of Exodus and see uh, the stubbornness of the people as they crossed through the wilderness, that 40-year journey, and the complaining and the bitterness and, and all of that. They forgot so much of what God had done. I don't know about you, but I'm getting to a place, well, I, I got there a few years ago, that I need to write down everything or else I'm going to forget it. So if you tell me something that you want me to remember, make sure I write it down or put it in my phone. Uh, before I leave the doctor's office, I put the next appointment in my phone because if they give me one of those cards, those appointment cards, guess what? I'm going to lose the card and I'll forget where I put it. So I need to put that <laughs> in my phone. So, you know, we do that. We make those... Uh, you know, we make those changes in our life, you know, to remember the important things that come up, that, that, are, that are there for us. And we can be prone to forget. 
But it's not only about the temporal things, it's not about appointments and schedules, but sometimes we forget about the goodness of God as demonstrated by his past blessings. You know, we should be able to, as believers, look back and see God's hand upon us and be reminded of that. Now, that's not to say that life is not going to have its struggles and its difficulties, but it's especially, I think, during those times where we need to remember what God has done. Amen? Sometimes we get to a a place of trial in our life and, and we're so caught up in, in the trial that we forget that God had, his hand was upon us all the way through. He brought us to that point. You know, I want to, can you just put up the image of the gravestone? So, if it's up there, yeah. So probably many of you have noticed this if you go to a Jewish cemetery or any, or any cemetery where there's maybe a Jewish uh, burial site. Um, According to Jewish tradition, mourners visiting the gravesite of a loved one will also o- often place a stone on top of the grave marker before departing. Like many of the traditions, we, we kind of search for the origin of something like that, and uh, there can be many different explanations about this. But one of the explanations can be directly traced to this passage that we're going through today in Joshua chapter 4 where the Bible relates this story of God commanding uh, Joshua to create a memorial comprising of 12 stones that would would commemorate God's faithfulness, commemorate God's goodness so that we would not forget. So they established this maybe to remind one another of the grace of God, of the person that's passed, and the impact that they've had on their lives. You know, sometimes we forget. Sometimes people need something tangible. There's not, nothing much more tangible for us than a, a heavy rock, right? That's, you can feel it in your hand. It's solid and it's perpetual. It's, there, it's pretty much there forever. So that's something that is tangible, that people... Uh, used to remember these things, God's faithfulness. 17 years ago in my life, personally, God provided for me something tangible as a memorial stone. I don't know if you can see this up there. Can you, can you see what this is? A, it's a hospital bracelet. Okay, this is from 19, this is from 2005. Okay, 2005. So that's 16 years ago, I was 47, it says on this bracelet. I didn't think I was ever that young. (laughs) So why do I have this from 16 years ago? Well, I was hospitalized with, like, the worst abdominal pain I ever had. And I know many of you have experienced different things, but for me, this was bad. This was really bad. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know if it was food poisoning. I didn't know if it was appendicitis. I didn't know what was happening. So in January of 2005, I was hospitalized, and they diagnosed me with pancreatitis. Now, if any of you know a little bit about pancreatitis, um, it's usually caused by either gallstones or sometimes people who have an alcohol problem will develop pancreatitis. Well, it took me about a half a day to convince the doctor that, well, he didn't see any gallstones, to convince the doctor that I was, I was not an alcoholic because he said there's no other explanation for this. And so he said, uh, my wife went out of the room for a moment and he said, okay, now you can tell me. Are you having, no, seriously. He didn't know what to, uh, how to, determine why I got this extremely acute, painful pancreatitis attack. Well, I was hospitalized for about five days, and for me, um, you know, the doctors took care of me. Everything went great. They gave me antibiotics, painkillers, and all, and I was there, and uh, uh, um, along the time where I was hospitalized, people came to visit like they normally do, and 
uh, a few of the friends from, uh, from church came and visited me, and like we, like we tend to do when we visit someone in the hospital if we're a believer, we talk to people. So they went over to, to the uh, man that was in the bed next to me, a 93-year-old man named John, and they started to share the gospel with him. You know, of course, they asked him how he was doing. He was in for a pretty serious condition, and they, uh, they went over and they just shared Jesus with this man. And one after another, they kept sharing Christ with John. And one point, one day before I was uh, discharged, John came to faith in, in Christ. And yeah, amen. And so for me, the reason I have this 16 years later is because through my most severe pain and trial and, uh, and trouble, God was working. God was working. This for me is a memorial stone of God's grace, of God's faithfulness. You know, we can be in our most desperate situation and we can look back sometimes and see God's hand upon us. And what an awesome thing. It's okay. I was in pain, but John got saved, right? And we actually, uh, my wife and I actually got in touch with him a little while later, a couple weeks later, he was moved to a rehab center. We, We visited him there. And then within about uh, another two weeks, he had passed. So God's awesome. His grace is amazing. I never want to forget that. I never want to be in a place where I forget that. He was at work saving someone in the midst of my trial, in the midst of my pain. And like the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness, um, God's working even in the midst of that. He's bringing people to himself. Romans 8.28 tells us, and we know, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. God's working something out even in the midst of difficulties. And we can be forgetful, right, at times. Psalm 103, one of my favorite psalms, says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Forget not. Sometimes when the danger has passed, when the pain is over, when the trial has um, been relieved in your life, when that, when that uh, situation has been, has been taken care of, sometimes when life gets back to normal, we tend to, for- to forget too. It's not only in the midst of our difficulty, sometimes when things are, are okay. You know, there's danger when we're in the valley of despair of forgetting. There's also danger on the mountaintop of rejoicing that we might forget God's grace. So why are memorials so important? I think I've given you a couple of reasons today to understand that better. But aside from the fact that they can be for us a reminder of what God has done. They can also be for others a testimony of God's grace. They can be used in our lives to teach others about God's mercy. We can share God's love in the lives of others who are struggling, who are searching, and as we've seen in the past year, and we see, we see every, all the time, people are hopeless sometimes. They need hope. They need a word of encouragement. And sometimes those memorial stones are in our lives for that reason, so that we can bring others the message of hope. How many opportunities maybe have we had in the past year to demonstrate faith instead of fear, right? To give people hope. To share God's faithfulness when it looks like everything's falling apart. And that's what that's about. It's about remembering those things. Back to Joshua 4 and verses 6 through 9, it says that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off from before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan. 
The waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so just as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones from the midst of the Jordan as the Lord had spoken to Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel and carried them over with them to the place where they lodged and laid them down there. Memorial stones were a way for the children of Israel to share their faith also with that next generation. The Bible tells us that believers have all been given the ministry of reconciliation. All that means is that we're to bring the message of salvation to those who are lost. That's the ministry that we've all been given. And many times the most effective way to do that is by our own testimony of what God has done in our lives. We all have a story to tell, don't we? If we're a believer in Jesus, there was a moment in your life where you spiritually crossed over the Jordan and started to grab hold of the promises of God. Allow that to become your testimony to others, especially to your children and grandchildren. You have opportunity to do that. President Reagan was quoted once as saying, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on to them to do the same. Or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in the United States where men were free. In the context of the 21st century church, we could say the same thing. It's our responsibility to pass on to our children and grandchildren our faith. Story is told about a British poet named Samuel Coleridge who had a discussion with a man who firmly believed that children should not be given any formal religious instruction, but should be free to choose for their own, relig their, choose their own religious faith when they reached maturity. Coleridge didn't, agree, didn't disagree, but instead invited the man into his somewhat neglected garden. The visitor exclaimed, do you call this a garden? There are nothing but weeds here. Coleridge replied, well, you see, I didn't want to infringe on the liberty of the garden in any way. I was just giving it a chance to express itself. I think we need to be intentional about teaching our children, teaching our grandchildren about the grace of God, about the love of God, or else it may be lost. If we neglect to remind our children of God's faithfulness in our past, they may neglect to carry it into their own future. Joshua 4, 7 says, Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan. The waters were cut off, and these stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel forever. The memorial stones were to endure forever. The witness of the memorial was to be a perpetual declaration of the power and the deliverance of God. Some things in this world will not last. Most things in this world will not last. But the faith of the millions who've gone before us will last into eternity. Proverbs twenty two twenty eight says, Do not remove the ancient landmark which your fathers have set. Those landmarks were those, were those uh, markers that set the boundaries of people's property. And it was a crime to remove them, like, just like it, it is today you know, for you to take someone's property without permission. But we can also understand that that proverb has a spiritual side to it, doesn't it? A landmark, a custom, a tradition, Christian values. They should not be removed lightly. If believers don't pass that on to others, it may be lost forever. And it's not only our children and our grandchildren, but the whole world needs to hear God's grace and his desire for a relationship. 
Going, moving down further in the chapter in verses 20 to 24, it says, And those twelve stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal. Then he spoke, then he spoke to the children of Israel, saying, When your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What are these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel crossed over the Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea when he dried up before us until we had crossed over, that all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever, or that you may respect or be in awe of the Lord your God forever. When the, man, when the men got to Gilgal, they erected this memorial of 12 stones. And there was two things in mind there. First, it was a teaching tool for future generations, right? Joshua knew that the children would look at this pile of stones, just like any curious child will, and say, what, what is that? What is that pile of stones there? What, what does that mean? You know, I love the curiosity of kids. You know, they'll just, they'll just ask it. They'll see something they won't understand it. They'll just ask. What a great opportunity. And their fathers would say, well, these stones came from the Jordan River, and they'll re relate that story to their children of God's faithfulness that the children of Israel walked through on dry ground. The second thing that that memorial uh, meant was it was a testimony to the watching world. Verse 24 said he did this, and again, this is the Red Sea crossing, so the peoples of the earth might know the hand of the Lord is powerful. But the stones would be that reminder also to the world, to those unbelievers in that region, to those who would come in and try to attack the nation of Israel, that they would see this and that they would know that there was something there. God had brought his people safely into the promised land. God's faithfulness was testified to by this pile of stones. You know, I think we can pretty much all agree that uh, when we look at the world, it's, it's in a heap of trouble. People can't seem to get along on almost any level. Um, hopefully, prayerfully, within the church, we can get along with one another. And it's up to us, I think, to share the love of Christ. I think it's up to us to share the love of Jesus, the hope that is in him, with all of those who would be in our sphere of influence, and then to go out and just multiply that. Matthew 5, 14 to 16, Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. See, that's why our influence on others is so important, because we are a light in a dark world. We are called to be a light to people and not to bring the spotlight on, our, on ourselves, but to glorify God. Crossing the Jordan was a major change for the nation of Israel. You know, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and now that was over. No longer would God provide manna from heaven to feed them. Now they would need to walk by faith in the promises of God. And he sent the Ark of the Covenant, his presence before them into the overflowing waters of the Jordan to encourage them. God's presence going before them. God's presence going before us. Every step. It says in the Psalms that your word is a light to my path a lamp to my feet. Allow God by his word to illuminate that path before you. He'll do it. 
Just as God had parted the Red Sea to deliver Israel from bondage, he would also part the Jordan to lead them into the promised land. So with these stones of remembrance, the Israelites here built a monument to commemorate the crossing over. It's kind of the old life to the new life, right? The pile of stones reminded Israel what God had done for them. He cared for them. He wanted the best for them. He, he led them into this land flowing with milk and honey, just as he'll do for us. God is faithful. His promises never fail. And the path may not always be smooth, but God will be with us. He's promised never to leave us or forsake us. So my question for you is, what can you erect in your life as a memorial, a stone of remembrance? I have something that I've kept for 16 years and hope to keep it forever, and I refer to it every once in a while. It's just, it's just for me, something tangible that, I, that I, I use to allow myself to remember what God has done. But what has God done in your past? that you can continue to go back to for encouragement and strength in the midst of trials or in the midst of, you know, everything's going well. Sometimes we tend to forget. It's those things that he's done along the way, his hand upon you. And they help you keep connected, right, to God's goodness. But maybe you're here today, and I don't know all of you, but maybe you don't have a relationship with God. Maybe this whole concept of, of stones of remembrance uh, is, is foreign to you. You don't quite understand what it's all about. Now, maybe like me, your memory is starting to fade, but, but that's kind of a natural thing that happens. But what do you do now if you don't have a relationship with the Lord and um, maybe no one's told you of His faithfulness? Maybe no one's shared the love of Christ. Maybe no one's told you that God desires a relationship and he desires to give you an abundant life. Maybe you're going through this life and maybe you're watching online and you're just, you're at the end of your rope. You don't know where to go. And no one's shared the fact that God wants a relationship with you individually. He desires that no one should perish, the Bible says but that you may have eternal life, which is only found in His Son, Jesus. Speaking of Jesus, the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, coming to Him, coming to God as a living stone, rejected indeed by men. That's Jesus. He was rejected by men. Right? He was put up for... Uh, crucifixion for nothing that he had done. Injected, uh, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, you also who have been saved, you also are living stones being built up in a spiritual house, a, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sac sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. Spiritual sacrifices. Therefore, it's also contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Jesus Christ is that chief cornerstone, the one that the builders rejected, that Israel rejected, and yet it has opened up the door for all men to come to him. Jesus is that ultimate living stone, the chief cornerstone. God has chosen him to build his church upon, and he's also chosen us as believers, as living stones, into that relationship with him and then to share that with others. Everyone who puts their faith in Jesus will be saved. There will be none lost, but it just takes that step of faith, right? Right? It takes that step, just as the priests stepped out in faith 
to cross the Jordan. You notice they kind of dip their toes in at the edge, at the water's edge, not knowing. They were told to step in first. And then they saw the, the water's part. Sometimes we need to take that step of faith. But when we do, Jesus will be there. He's going he's gonna to take us through. Right to the, exactly where he wants us to go. Romans 10, 9 and 10, our last scripture for today, says that if you confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Let's, let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your working in our lives. And Lord, for those who don't have that relationship with you and have heard something today that just drew, has drawn them, Lord, we ask that you would continue to draw them by your grace. Conti continue to show them, Lord, that relationship with you that you desire to have with each and every person. Continue, Lord, to uh, just uh, let them know how much you care, how much you love them. And Lord, we ask today that if there is someone here who does not have that relationship, that you would draw them now that you would, by your grace, allow them to uh, take that step of faith. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to have the worship team go through a chorus and just, uh, if that's you, maybe you've never taken that step. Maybe today you want to have that relationship with Jesus and then go forward and just have those awesome opportunities in your life that he wants to have for you, those, that abundant life that he wants. So if that's you sitting here, uh, whether you're in the balcony or even downstairs, come forward as they go through this song and we'll pray with you to receive the Lord. You come. Bible tells us that we can cast our care upon him because he cares for us. And he does. And if you believe that and want that for yourself, and maybe you're a little intimidated by taking this walk up, that's okay. Stick around afterwards and we can pray with you. Or if there's someone at home that's watching and that really desires that relationship, we're going we're gonna to say a prayer. And if that's the... Uh, if that's your heart, then just repeat it after me and um, 
And then just let us know that. We can send you some materials and a Bible to get you started in that walk. So repeat this after me if that's you. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I need salvation that only you can provide. Thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for me. I ask that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So maybe that's someone here who prayed that prayer or someone at home. We'd love to talk to you and pray with you and help get you started in that walk. Well, why don't we stand and uh, the team is going to lead us in closing worship tonight. God bless you.